Now I would like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Rosalowski, and thank her for joining us today. Before turning it over to Dr. Rosalowski, I'd like to give you a brief introduction. Dr. Rosalowski is a pediatric chronologist at the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta, and is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Alberta. Dr. Rosalowski served on the expert committee for the 2018 Diabetes Canada Clinical Practice Guidelines and co-authored the chapter entitled Type 1 Diabetes in Children and Adolescents. For more information on Dr. Rosalowski, please read the speaker bio section on the left of your screen. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Rosalowski. Thank you, Grace, and thank you, Farah. And thank all of you for joining us today for this Diabetes Canada webinar. It is a tremendous honor to be asked on behalf of Diabetes Canada to lead this webinar on what I think is a very important topic. Finding out that your child has been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is a life-changing event. There can be a lot of thoughts and feelings that surface at this time, concern and fear over the immediate and future health of your child, maybe anxiety and insecurity about the practical aspects of caring for a child with type 1 diabetes or guilt that this happened to your child. For some of you in the audience, you've had no previous experience with diabetes, let alone diabetes in the child, and the unknown can be very scary. For others, you may know someone who lives with diabetes, yet the experience is even more personal and real for you now that it is your child who has been diagnosed. Our goal through this webinar is to introduce you to information that you might find helpful in the early days following a new diagnosis of type 1 diabetes in your child. I'd like to take you through what you can expect in the first couple of weeks following diagnosis. I'll explain the importance of initial diabetes education and the healthcare professionals who comprise your child and family's diabetes care team. Notice that I said your child and family's diabetes care team. This is deliberate because the care of children with type 1 diabetes inevitably requires parents and caregivers to be actively involved. Children with diabetes go to school and they participate in extracurricular activities, so I'll broach the topic of involving school administrators, teachers, coaches in your child's diabetes care. Last but not least, I want to provide some resources and tips gleaned from my experience over the years caring for children and teenagers with type 1 diabetes. I tell these children and their parents that I am constantly learning from them, and I hope to impress upon you how valuable your peers can be as resources and supports. You've heard in the introduction about who I am. Now I'd like to find out a little bit more about who you are. Please tell us how you are related to a child or an adolescent who has been newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus. We'll just take a couple of seconds to do that. Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds. Okay, let's find out who you are. All right. So the bulk of you in the audience today are healthcare providers, and then it's really good to see that there are parents uh, online, as well as some grandparents and at least one friend out there. Uh, there are there are some people out there who've marked other. Um, I don't know what that means yet, um, but I'm really glad that you are in the audience. Uh, this webinar was designed, though, mostly to address the parents and caregivers of children or adolescents newly diagnosed with type 1. So throughout, I am going to be directing my conversation um, to them. Okay. So there are many different reactions that you may have experienced when you found out that your child was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Your child may have presented in diabetic ketoacidosis, and this can be very scary. On the other hand, maybe your child was diagnosed without any metabolic decompensation or even incidentally in being worked up for something else, 
and in which case there might be some disbelief. Other people may have experience with diabetes and may actually have suspected it in their child, and there may be this sort of bittersweet combination of relief at knowing what's going on, but disappointment at knowing what's going on. So these reactions may initially have started off as disbelief, grief, guilt, fear, and anxiety. It's also possible that you may not have reacted in these ways right away, but maybe you experience them later on. When I speak to parents of children who have been diagnosed with diabetes, they do not forget the dates on which their child was diagnosed. And some of them can even remember the initial blood glucose level. It can be an incredibly overwhelming time for your child and for you, and it is really important to acknowledge this. I would like to reassure you, though, that it will not always feel so overwhelming. I really do believe that you don't know how strong you are until you're challenged to be. I just also wanted to say to the parents and caregivers in the audience right away, straight up, it is not your fault that your child developed type 1 diabetes. It is not your child's fault that he or she developed diabetes. It is not because you fed your child too much of one thing or too little of the other thing. There is no way at this time to prevent type 1 diabetes from happening. Type 1 diabetes is due to the autoimmune-mediated loss of the insulin-producing cells of the pancreas. We in the diabetes community strive for the day when type 1 diabetes will be a thing of the past, as there is currently no cure. But in the meantime, the goal of management is to avoid complications of type 1 diabetes. We know that this is possible. There are plenty of adults out there who have lived with type 1 diabetes for more than 50 years who have no complications. We also know from seminal research done in the early 1990s that we can reduce the risk of complications by aiming for lower glucose levels. At the same time, we want to balance this against having too many episodes of severe hypoglycemia. You might ask, how do we do this? The answer is, with some diabetes know-how. Type 1 diabetes differs from other medical conditions in that the components of management happen on a daily basis outside of the hospital and the physician's office. Managing type 1 diabetes includes learning how to administer insulin and make insulin adjustments, how to monitor glucose levels, and how to plan meals and count carbohydrates. Diabetes management uh, is therefore uh, about self-management, not physician management or nurse management, but self-management. These tasks may seem really overwhelming to learn and do at first, but rest assured that they are doable. As one of my professors who himself has lived with type 1 diabetes for over 25 years used to tell me, it becomes a second nature as shaving. Diabetes education is the key to learning how to manage diabetes on a day-to-day -day basis. At the same time, type 1 diabetes management must also fit and adapt to the physical and developmental changes of children and adolescents who are growing and maturing. Parents play a very important role in the child's type 1 diabetes experience. The younger the child, the more he or she depends on the parent to perform day-to-day -day diabetes care tasks. At any age, the attitude of the parent towards type 1 diabetes can influence the child's acceptance and attitude towards diabetes as well. There's ample research out there demonstrating that children and adolescents with type 1 diabetes do best when they perceive their parents as being supportive. How much direct, hands-on diabetes care is done by you, the parent or caregiver, compared to your child depends on your child's age and developmental level. With that said, even teenagers who have been newly diagnosed may need you to do for them initially. That's okay.
Your child may have been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes through various channels. She or he may have had the classical symptoms of very frequent urination, intense thirst and drinking, and weight loss. With these suspicious symptoms, you may have brought them to a doctor's office who ordered blood or urine tests. On the other hand, your child may have experienced a period of vomiting, abdominal pain, and a shift in their mental awareness, and diabetes may have been diagnosed in the context of diabetic ketoacidosis. If there was metabolic decompensation, then there would have been a brief period of hospitalization. In any case, after diagnosis, diabetes education should begin immediately. In some places in Canada, initial diabetes education is done in the hospital over several days to a week. In other places, the education is done as an outpatient in a clinic over two to four days. There is no difference in outcomes for someone who received initial teaching through an inpatient setting versus an outpatient setting, though I think that families and the child do prefer being able to go home and sleep in their own beds every night. So either can be appropriate venues for the teaching to take place. However, what is not appropriate is being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes without any form of comprehensive teaching on glucose monitoring, insulin administration, or nutrition. Simply being prescribed insulin and given a glucometer without any practical instruction is absolutely insufficient. If this has happened to you, please request a referral to a pediatric diabetes center right away. Diabetes Canada states that all children with new onset type 1 diabetes and their families require intensive diabetes education by an interprofessional pediatric diabetes healthcare team. The members of this healthcare team should include a pediatric endocrinologist or a pediatrician with expertise in pediatric diabetes, a dietitian, a nurse educator, a social worker, and or a mental health professional. Why would Diabetes Canada make such a recommendation? The growing bodies of children and adolescents and their social, cognitive, and emotional maturation, along with the fact that they depend on parents and other caregivers, necessitates this specialized care in order to achieve the best outcomes. Each and every one of these members of the diabetes healthcare team serves a crucial function. A pediatric endocrinologist is a physician who has trained to care for infants, children, and adolescents. They have completed additional training to become experts in conditions that affect hormones like diabetes. She or he will do the physical exam, order and interpret laboratory tests, and order medications. Often, the pediatric endocrinologist is also involved with or is aware of research studies in type 1 diabetes, and this may be interesting for you. The nurse, the dietitian, and the psychosocial professional are crucial members of this healthcare circle. The nutritionist can provide invaluable education to your child and family about how different foods affect blood glucose levels. She or he will teach you how to read food labels and how to determine how much carbohydrate is in a serving of food. The nurse is the healthcare professional who will teach you much of the how-to of diabetes care. This person understands the different types of insulin regimens and the technologies to monitor glucose and is a tremendous resource for diabetes-related education. She or he is also typically the first point of contact when you call the clinic for advice about what to do. Last but not least, you and your child should have access to a social worker. The social worker assists families with making sure that there is sufficient drug and medical coverage. Sometimes families must travel a long way to attend the initial diabetes education, and the social worker can work with the family to facilitate lodging and transportation. 
the social worker should also discuss with you and help you fill out the disability tax credit form from the Canadian Revenue Agency. In some pediatric diabetes education centers, there is a psychologist or other mental health professional instead of a social worker. The diagnosis of type 1 diabetes can be very overwhelming and the psychologist can help with coping or making referrals for more in-depth support. So what happens after initial diagnosis? What happens after initial education? So what I'd like to do is to discuss what to expect after these first two to three weeks. You can expect that your child's symptoms will improve. The frequent urination and thirst will go away. The bedwetting should stop. Appetite and energy levels should improve. I can tell you when I see children back for follow-up four to six weeks afterwards, it's so reassuring and satisfying to see them back. Uh, to these bright-eyed, energetic people. The weight gain can be steep in the first month, but don't worry if the child adheres to his or her meal plan and, rec and the recommendations from the dietitian. this weight gain should ease off. Ideally, it should be the same healthcare team who sees you and your child during subsequent visits so that you get to know each other. Sometimes uh, video conferencing can be used in between uh, in-person visits. Uh, we in Canada live in a very large geographic terrain and this can make it difficult to attend in-person visits frequently. You should expect that your child is seen every three to six months by the healthcare team. In regards to this interprofessional healthcare team, your child won't necessarily see every single person on this healthcare team every single time, but your child should have access as needed to these various healthcare professionals. In the future, there might be times when your child needs more intensive nutrition education. During other times, maybe you or your child will want to speak to a social worker or a psychologist. At these visits, you can expect that your child will be weighed and measured for height. The insulin regimen will be reviewed, especially in light of how well it addresses the goals of optimizing glycemic control and quality of life while minimizing severe hypoglycemia. While the healthcare team will perform these tasks during a clinic visit, the diabetes follow-up visits really are best viewed as an opportunity for ongoing education or review. Again, diabetes differs from other conditions in that the crux of management is self-directed. This means that 99.9% .9 of diabetes care happens when you, you and your child are not in the clinic. Ongoing education is therefore essential. In my experience, those who approach these visits with an openness to learn and self-manage and come prepared tend to be the most successful. Even if you as parents feel eventually that you have a good grasp of diabetes knowledge and skills, as your child ages and becomes more mature, it is important for your child to have access to acquiring this knowledge and skills. I also strongly encourage you to get your child back into doing the activities that he or she loves to do. When I sit down with a child who's been newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, one of the first questions I ask him or her is, what do you love to do? I stress that my goal is to help the child get back into doing those activities that she or he loves doing. Maybe your child loves playing sports like hockey or soccer or maybe your child is in gymnastics or dance. Some of you in the audience might have teenage children who have after-school or weekend jobs. It is absolutely possible to participate in these activities. It will take some planning around carbohydrate intake, glucose monitoring, and adjusting insulin, and your diabetes healthcare team can assist you in planning for these activities until you feel more comfortable doing so on your own. Most children will also attend school outside of their home. 
And this routine of going to school can provide structure to your child di child's diabetes care routines. Many families of children with type 1 diabetes, they talk about how the structure and routine of the school day are beneficial to their child's glycemic control. Returning to routines such as school and after school activities also sends a very important message that diabetes cannot hold your child down. I would like to say a word about diabetes at school. Children spend a lot of time at school, up to 35 hours a week. This can be even longer for children whose parents both work full time outside of the home. This means that they can be in someone else's care for an even larger part of the day. Diabetes care does not stop when the child goes to school. The tasks of balancing food intake and physical activity with insulin need to continue. Adolescents also go to school, of course, but they may be more independent in performing these tasks compared to elementary school age children who still require supervision. Children with diabetes should be encouraged to be physically active and participate in all regular school activities, including field trips. Food intake and glucose monitoring become even more important around activity. Not eating a full meal or snacks can put children at risk for hypoglycemia. Both extremes of high and extremes of low glucose can also affect learning. I know that your child returning to school can be another source of anxiety and worry, so your diabetes healthcare team is also aware of this and can be a source of help. If you haven't already done so on behalf of your child, you will need to have a conversation with your child's principal and teacher about their diagnosis. We recommend that an individualized care plan, or an ICP, be developed for each student with diabetes and discussed among parents or guardians and the school principal and teacher with input from the healthcare provider as well as your child as appropriate. This individualized care plan should clearly outline the roles and the responsibilities of the school personnel, the parents, and the child with diabetes. I also think that these ICPs should be reviewed at least once a year. In recognition of these challenges, the Canadian Pediatric Society published a position statement recommending that minimal standards for supervision and care be established across Canada to support children and youth with type 1 diabetes in schools. Be aware, though, that these policies and resources currently differ from one province to another in Canada. That means what you might hear about what's going on in Ontario isn't necessarily what's going on in Alberta. This position statement has also been endorsed by the Canadian Pediatric Endocrinology Group and aligns with the Diabetes Canada guidelines for the care of students living with diabetes at school. I started off this webinar by acknowledging that there can be a lot of thoughts and feelings that accompany to the news that your child has been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. What can be really tough too, I think, is having to put these feelings temporarily to one side when you and your child are immersed immediately into diabetes education. I am realistic enough to know that these feelings, they also don't go away right away, and from time to time, they might resurface. I've included here on this slide some questions and statements that have been expressed to me over the years by the families that I have gotten to know. Why did this happen? No one in my family has diabetes. Could I have prevented this from happening? What did I do wrong? I feel so alone. I don't know anyone else who has type 1 diabetes. Perhaps you too have at some point felt or expressed similar sentiments. I want you to know that you are not alone. In reality, Canada has the sixth highest incidence of childhood type 1 diabetes in the world. About one in 400 youth 
less than 18 years of age, has type 1 diabetes in Canada. This means that if your child goes to an elementary school or junior high or high school that has 400 students, chances are that there's at least one child in there who has type 1 diabetes. Again, you are not alone. In preparation for today's webinar, I asked many of the children and teenagers and their parents if they would be willing to share their experiences about being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Uh, they've, given me some, they've given me permission to share their thoughts with you. And I've included some of the quotes. Uh, I couldn't include everything, uh, but I included the quotes that I felt were reflected of some of the themes that kept coming up. This is a quote from Mia, who was a 16-year-old young woman who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes about four months before she made this statement. I didn't feel like type 1 diabetes could ever be part of my life. It all seemed so overwhelming at first. I felt that I was going to be the weird person who couldn't do it. Now, it's second nature. You can still play hockey, basketball, ride horses. Initially, I wanted to hide it, and I said so to my mom. But my mom said that I didn't have to hide it. It was nothing to be ashamed of. I think what this quote highlights is that Mia initially felt overwhelmed that the day-to-day -day management couldn't be done, that she'd be some kind of outlier. Now though, four months into her diagnosis, the aspects of her diabetes care are second nature. It's been really awesome for me to see that Mia has returned to her loves of playing hockey and riding her horses. I also think it's really important to stress here that her mother influenced her attitude towards diabetes Mia thought she should be ashamed of having diabetes and hide it, but her mother quickly dispelled her of that belief. Here's another quote from a parent this time. This is a mother of 14-year-old Erin who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes five years ago. I wanted to find out the cause. It drove me crazy that I couldn't figure out the cause. Was it not enough vitamin D? Did I not feed him right? First, I started trying to figure out why. Then I started researching how to reverse it. I searched the internet, and doing this can lead you down a crazy road. Eventually, though, I stopped searching. I realized I had to accept type 1 diabetes for what it is and move on. The peace for me came from this acceptance. I am grateful that we live in a time and a place where there is help for type 1 diabetes. I think you can sense the initial guilt that Aaron's mom was feeling and this urge to protect her son and make the diabetes go away. Some of you in the audience may have consulted with Dr. Google and can definitely empathize with uh, Aaron's mother's um, er frenetic search on the internet to try to find a reason for type 1 diabetes um, to have happened. Okay. I'd like to provide another quote from a parent uh, this is from the mother of 13-year-old Travis, who's had type 1 diabetes for three years, and I think she lends uh, a bit of a different perspective. I struggled for a long time with my son's diagnosis. I think he came to terms with it before I did. I just couldn't get past how unjust it is and the frustration as a mother of not being able to take it away from him. When people would say to me, it will be okay, I would think, you don't know that, and you certainly cannot promise that and I would feel so much hurt and anger. I think I was waiting for some magical moment of acceptance or something to just wash over me. Then I decided that maybe not being okay with it would be how I was going to be okay with it. It is not okay that his childhood has to be tarnished with thoughts of carb counting and blood glucose checks. It is not okay that there is no cure. So I take that feeling and use it to help my son and help others to research better treatments and possible cures. To a newly di diagnosed family, all I can say is, no, type 1 diabetes won't ever be okay, but it will, what it will be is more manageable, easier, and your new normal, and it won't own you either. In her case, Travis's mom has found a way to transform her frustration into activities that foster health and resilience in her son 
and among others living with type 1 diabetes. So her 13-year-old son, Travis, has also chimed in, and I think that his experience resonates with his mother's. If you take care of yourself and do what works for you, it won't change anything. You can do anything you wanted to before you were diagnosed. It doesn't change your school life, your activities, or any of the plans for the future. You just don't let it. This is the last, but definitely not least, quote that I'll share with you from the mother of a nine-year-old, of nine-year-old Kasim, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes two years ago. I've found that I've had to correct people when they say things like, I thought you had to be obese to get diabetes, or people who say, you can't eat that cake. Well, actually you can, you just have to learn how to adjust for it. These have become teaching moments for me. I really like Kasim's mother's approach. There are going to be people out there who might say things to you about type 1 diabetes that come off hurtful or just plain wrong. There's a saying that my husband is always reminding me of, and it goes like this. Don't attribute to malevolence what you can blame on ignorance. Chances are you are going to end up knowing more about type 1 diabetes than almost anyone else. So use these types of encounters as moments to instruct and advocate for your child. Okay, one last word of encouragement. If the feelings of guilt, worry, fear, or isolation persist, though, I would encourage you to take steps to take care of yourself. You might want to approach your diabetes healthcare team first and, either, and speak with any of the members of the healthcare team. I'd like to wrap up my portion of this webinar by leaving you with some resources. Again, your child's diabetes healthcare team will probably have the best knowledge of local resources like events and conferences. Tap into their expertise. That's what they're there for. Those of you who have successfully found your way to this webinar already know that Diabetes Canada is a tremendous resource for information regarding type 1 diabetes children in children and adolescents. I just wanted to put a special shout out for the D camps that are sponsored by Diabetes Canada. Uh, these are focused on children and teens with type 1 diabetes. And I can tell you as somebody who has staffed these camps before, your child will have so much fun. They will be exhausted from all the activities like canoeing and archery that they get to do but I can't promise that they're going to sleep at night in their cabins because they're probably going to be up all night talking to their new friends. Just be aware, though, that there are camps, D-camps, that are designed for families. Every five years, Diabetes Canada updates its clinical guidelines for the care of diabetes. The 2018 updated version of uh, updated chapter on type 1 diabetes in children and adolescents is currently openly available on the Internet. Information on the disability tax credit form is also available through this website. I encourage any parent of a child or adolescent with type 1 diabetes to apply for this tax credit. Diabetes at School is a national initiative developed by the Canadian Pediatric Society in partnership with Diabetes Canada. If you go onto that website, which is provided on the slide, you'll access a whole bunch of practical training tools that can be used for educators, school administrators, and parents. And these tools are available in both French and English. Children with Diabetes is an online community of youth with type 1 diabetes, their parents, families, and friends. Uh, Children with Diabetes also sponsors the Friends for Life conference. These conferences happen all over the world, and there is one happening in Canada this year. We live in an age of social media, and I can tell you that the Facebook uh, presence of uh, parents of children with diabetes is very active. And again, last but not least, many parents of children with diabetes within the clinic your child attends are also very open to having coffee or tea and chatting. They've lived through the experience of the new diagnosis, and they can empathize with you. So I think I'll wrap up here now, 
and um, just leave you with these parting thoughts, again, formed from advice from parents who have over the years uh, asked me to um, spread this or to tell this to newly diagnosed children and their families. Take it day by day and don't be intimidated by, especially by how others manage their child's diabetes. If you do get involved with the type 1 diabetes community or with other families, you're going to hear a lot of different management types, technologies, and terms, and it can seem very overwhelming. But remember, those people have likely been at this a long time, and they were beginners once too.